Brother Jake, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Simple question, not complicated. Can faith save you? Can faith save you? Just yes. simple. Thank you. Yes. Brother Ross, can faith save him? Yes. Brother Doug, can faith save him? Yes, sir. All right. Good news. <laughs> There's a chartered plane waiting for us after the service. We're all going to get on it. I'm going to put Jake in the plane, and we're going to push him out without a parachute. Brother Jake, can faith save you? Uh, I'm probably going to hit that ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the point on all that is um, Calvinists look at that question, and they assume some things. They assume the question is, can faith save you from hell? And when I read the question, I initially thought, can faith save you from hell? And the answer would be yes. But if you overlook the context on what's being asked, then you will miss what James was actually saying. If you go to the verse before that, he says that you will have judgment without mercy. That's a statement. So the question, can faith save him, isn't a question that says, can faith save him from hell? It's a question that says, can faith save him from judgment without mercy? And since the statement says you will have judgment without mercy if you show no mercy, it doesn't mention faith at all. So if you have faith, that's not going to save you from receiving judgment without mercy. Uh, this morning, we actually had a good example of judgment with mercy. If you remember, there was a car alarm that went off <laughs> this morning. And if you remembered how that was handled, what you saw was an instance of mercy. There was no retribution. There was no discipline, nothing like that. That was judgment, in a way, with, with mercy. So if you show people mercy when you judge them, then you will receive mercy when it's your turn to be judged. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. That's what mercy is. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. I used to have an employee named Mark, and uh, one time uh, there was, um, the vacuum cleaner in the store was broken. And when I bought the parts to get it fixed, he was all excited about helping me to fix it. I couldn't figure out how it was broken, but with his enthusiasm, I came to realize he actually broke the vacuum cleaner. So I never challenged him on it. I never called him on it because in our relationship, I found that I would do stupid things and then I would forgive myself and then he would go do stupid things. And so I had to forgive him too because I was doing the same stupid things. And that's kind of funny. Um, in that regards. James starts off chapter one saying, my brethren, and he's writing to believers and Calvinists will want you to think that this is James' attempt to redefine salvation by saying, if you have, if you're saved, then you'll have the works. But nobody writes a book in the New Testament written to believers telling them how they should be saved. The assumption is they're already saved. They started a church, they're already saved. So James isn't writing his book telling people how to be saved. He's just reinforcing Leviticus chapter 19, verse 15, which says, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. And after this, James gets into uh, an example that we know about with the rich man and the poor man. So I've asked Jake if he'd volunteer to help me illustrate this. And so, Brother Jake, you're going to be the rich man, okay? And I'm going to give you a seat of honor because you're rich and everybody knows you're rich and everybody can see me doing this. So if you'll come up here, I'm going to give you this seat of honor. 
And we're going, I'm going to say, you know, we're happy to have you tonight. Bless Thank your you. heart. Thanks for having Yes, we love having rich people in our church. Yes. <laughs> now, I didn't, did you tell Jake? James? No. James, I'm going to borrow you too. James, he's going to be our poor man, okay? And I'm going to have you sit right here on the top of the stair, okay? Now, you notice I did something different. I gave him a good seat, and I had him sit on the stair. Now, the difference between a rich man and a poor man is like this. James, do you own a house? Yes. You own a house? No. No. Do you own a car? Yes. You own a car? <laughs> do you own a refrigerator? No. Do you own a stove or an oven? How about a washer or a dryer? Okay. Good thing you know somebody who's rich. Because the rich man there, he owns the house, he owns a car, he owns a bed, a refrigerator, a stove, an oven, a washer and dryer. You own a couple of properties too, don't you? Yes, sir. That's the definition of a rich man. Now, the thing about this is Calvinists will say, if you're saved, then you'll have the works. Now, I invited Jake in, and I sent him up here. And what I did for Jake was actually a good work, correct? Yes, sir. The Bible says if you give a cup of water in my name, that is a good work. You will receive a reward. Now, for James, you might debate me on this, but I would say I did a good work for James. The reason I say that is I did not reject him. I allowed him into the assembly. I gave him a seat, but I set him on the stairs. So, the problem here is James in the Bible says, I did sin. I sinned when I gave him a good seat. I sinned when I sat him down. So when a Calvinist says, if you're saved, you'll have the works, you need to flip that around on the Calvinist and say, well, do you mean good sinful works or good sinful works? Okay? Because either one was sinful works. Now, the irony in all this is that in verse 5, James says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? So this little guy, he's poor, but he's rich in faith. Now, I think I said last time, when you see a Bible verse that has the word faith or believe, and it has the reward, then what you have is a salvation verse. So James said, the poor of this world are rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. So this little guy is rich in faith and he's heirs of the kingdom. If James was serious about needing works as part of salvation, he would have said right here, God has chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and in works and are heirs of the kingdom. But James didn't do that. Now, the rich guy over here, he's not mentioned here as being rich in faith. So the problem with being rich in possessions is you can put your faith in your possessions, and that's not a good thing. So James chapter 2 is really about your faith. And so James, well, Calvinists will say, if you don't have the works, then you're not saved. But that's really not what James is saying. Oh, the irony is this, I forgot. If I am in need, I can't go to the poor man and say, do you have a car for me? I can't say, can you give me some money? Can you give me some food? I need a new stove. Can you give me a stove or a washer or a dryer? You can't go to the poor man and expect him to do any works like that. 
you have to go to the rich man because the rich man is the one that has possessions. Make sense? So it's ironic that James would say the poor man is rich in faith. But when you go in further on down, it's like James says, faith without works is dead. And the irony in that is people focus on the word dead. Faith without works is dead. But I like to flip verses around to make them say, say it in another way. And what I would say is the only way to keep your faith alive is through works. Okay? If you want to have a faith that is alive, then you need to do works. And in particular, I would say works of mercy. Faith without works is not a dead salvation. The Holy Ghost is the one who quickens your dead spirit. Your faith does not quicken your dead spirit. The Holy Ghost quickens you. Jesus is the one who will justify you, sanctify you, and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You can't do that yourself. I like what Brother Jake said last month. People who commit suicide, they can kill the body, but they can't kill the spirit. So you can't kill the spirit, and you can't lose your salvation because you can't kill your salvation. So if your faith is dead, all you do is you have dead faith. And if you want to keep your faith alive, what you need to do is works of mercy. The body without the spirit is dead. Faith without works is dead. The spirit without the body is alive. The spirit without works is alive. If your faith dies, your spirit is still alive. It doesn't kill it. Now, James talk, talks about what does it profit? Everybody in here has a need for profit. Brother Ross, you have your own business, correct? Do you hope to operate at a loss this year? Okay. <laughs> Do you hope to break even this year? The reason you want to do better than breaking even is because technically you would be at a loss. If your company breaks even, you have no profit left over for your family, okay? And everybody likes to have some profit. You might want to buy another house, you might want to buy a new house, you might want to buy a new car, new appliances, new clothes, or furniture. You might even want to go up to the Ark in Kentucky, okay? <laughs> Jake, James, no, I'm not done yet. I'm just going to let you go, but hold on. Um, one thing about poor people is, you know, they don't have a lot of things. Some poor people are homeless, and some poor people may not have access to a shower. And so they may smell. Would you move down a step, please? Thank you. I knew... Uh, I knew a little boy, he's 27 years old now. I used to take him to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And one day after, I think it was Sunday school, the teacher pulled me aside and said, would you talk to Marco about taking a bath? I didn't know, little boys didn't know you had to take a bath like every day or every other day. They would be happy just going on and not taking a bath. So my nose is up here, and he was down here. And the teacher, she was closer to him, so she could smell him. So, you know, when we, when we got in the car after church, I leaned over, and she was right. He really smelled. I just never had an occasion to lean over and sniff him. So... We worked that out, and uh, I think he takes a bath now. But he's 27, so I don't care. If he wants to, fine. 
<laughs> OK, now you two can go sit down. Thank you. Just going to give you a couple of verses to go along with this. Proverbs 19, 17. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. Luke 6, 35. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. Now, if you can love your enemies and do good and lend, what should you do for your brethren? Matthew 5, 42. Give to him that asketh, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. <coughs> One thing that generally gets overlooked in James chapter 2 is what is profit. If you do good works of mercy, what do you get out of return? Well, the first thing you get is when it's your turn to be judged, you will do, you will receive mercy. The other thing that James says, mercy, works of mercy will perfect your faith. If you want a stronger faith, then you need to do works of mercy. Otherwise, your faith could die. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as, his pur as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. When I was growing up, Homer Lindsay Jr. would preach on this verse, and he said, cheerful could also be interpreted as hilarious. So when you do works of mercy, when you are giving, do so hilariously, like it's just the greatest thing you can do. Growing up, well, I had various examples in my life that my family lived in front of me, like Adam lived today, showing mercy. I, have, I had a, Uncle Bert, and he had four children, and he was in the military. One time, he needed housing for his children. He had four children. And so we took in Philip and Denise, two of our cousins. And Uncle Nelson took in the other two, Cheryl and Cindy. Uncle Nelson um, was known for picking up homeless people, taking them to his house, getting them cleaned up, washing their clothes, and feeding them. Uncle Lewis, my father's fourth brother, uh, had two sons, and they knew of a little boy one time who came home from school and he found that his mother had left with her boyfriend. And when I say left, I mean he, she abandoned him. So our father took that little guy in, and he stayed with us for a little while. Uh, many of you know my sister. When my sister got married, uh, my room became her storage because Mike went off to the Air Force and did boot camp and all that. So for about a year, I went to college, and my room became storage. I could open the door, take one step in, and the room was filled with boxes, her stuff, an 8 by 10 room. And then you go into the living room, and you had a pathway to the TV and a pathway in front of the sofa, and where they could put boxes, they put boxes. I mentioned the little boy who was 10 years old. His name was Marco. He and his mother came into my store back in 2007. And when I opened the store, I determined that anybody who came in would be an appointment from God. And this was a unusual appointment. His mother walked in, and she laid her stuff out on the counter. She had some applications, passports, 
and some money orders. And as she was looking through it, trying to figure out what to do and me trying to figure out how to help her, she realized she forgot something. So she left and went home. She left her applications. She left her passports. She left her blank money orders, which really concerned me. And she left her little boy. And she went home. So I uh, wondered, what am I going to do with the little boy? And he was at that stage where he just talked and talked and talked and talked. He asked question after question after question. Eventually, she came back home, she came back to the store. And I figured out what to do with the money orders. And so I'm like, OK, we got that done. She left and went to the store next door. And again, she left Marco. So I didn't want him behind the counter because we were talking about computers, and he liked computers. So I let him behind the counter. And then we played a game, a tank game. I love the tank game. And so she came back about a couple of minutes later, and then she wanted to go home. And for some reason, Marco said, can I stay till 3 p.m.? I don't know why he said 3 p.m. So she said yes. I was hoping she'd say no, and she left. <laughs> I've never had this experience before. So come to find out, Marco was a latchkey kid. Uh, his father was not, did not live with them. He was over in Bosnia. And his mother cleaned rooms at the hotel. And so he'd go home after school and watch TV and keep himself occupied until she came home. So I was like, I've got a computer at home. I'll set it up in the store. And you can come, and I can watch you, and you can stay there. And at least you won't be at home. So not long after that, I uh, what took him to the post office, and on the way home, I figured I'd go back through downtown because that's where First Baptist was. So I showed him First Baptist, said, this is my church. He said, I said, would you like to go? He said, yes. So that's when I started taking him to church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Now, Marco and his mother were poor. They didn't have a lot. They didn't have a car. They rode the bus. And so... I lost my train of thought. So they didn't have a lot of stuff. So I, uh, I just made sure he went to church. <coughs> he didn't have a lot of stuff, but he loved wrestling. I hated wrestling. And it seemed like he had a wrestling T-shirt for every day of the week. He wore a wrestling T-shirt on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. He had shorts. I don't think he had long pants. And he had blue and white slippers. I don't know if you'd call them slippers or sandals. But the blue and white is the colors of Bosnia, so that was his way of saying he was Bosnian. So after taking him to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night for three months, and then talking to him about Jesus and God and who Jesus was, who's God, and his mother was an Orthodox Christian, so she was of no help. Um, I... After going through that and having him go to church all summer long, I came, he was at home, and I'm like, would you like to be saved? Would you like to pray the prayer? And he said yes. So we uh, prayed the prayer, and then I didn't say or do anything. I didn't want to pressure him because he was young. There's a language barrier. It's a new concept, new information, trying to figure out who Jesus is, what Jesus did. I know he got that at church. I wasn't concerned about that. So the next day uh, was Sunday, and Junior Hill was an evangelist who was preaching that day. So we went to church, sat up in the balcony. Now, you could take about 40 of these churches, like this church, and stack them on top of each other, and that's how big First Baptist was. It covered the entire block. So we sat up in the balcony in the middle, and if you wanted to go down to the front, you had to go all the way around to the stairs and then down the stairs to the front. So when the invitation was given, Marco said, when they said about baptize, I'm like, he asked, can I be baptized? I'm like, yes. Now, if you've ever dealt with a child, 
There are certain times when you think you have everything in line, and then you realize, oh, I forgot something. So as we stood up, he takes off running down, down the aisle. I'm like chasing him, trying to be an adult, not yelling, stop, Marco. I couldn't do that. So by the time I got halfway to the stairs, he was already at the stairs. And by the time I got to the stairs, he was down front wearing his wrestling T-shirt. I'm dying. <laughs> but he got baptized. And then we, we just went on with life. At, that was the beginning of September. At the end of September, I um, had two gentlemen from Albania walk in. They needed to rent a mailbox, so I rented them a mailbox. But one of them heard the gospel music playing in the background, because I played that in the background. So he came back that afternoon and asked for a job. But I couldn't give him a job because he came on a visitor visa. So I said, come back tomorrow, talk to the person who's going to be here. I wanted to get her input on what she thought about him. And so I came back, and he came back, and she talked to him. And I asked her what she thought. She said, yeah, you need them because Albanians are good, hard workers. But I couldn't hire them. So I said, come back tomorrow, which was Wednesday. And I said, do you want to go to church tonight? He said, yeah. So we went to church, and after church, I took him to where he was staying. Now, his friends were Albanians. They were relatively new, and they didn't know much about Jacksonville. If you know anything about Jacksonville, if I mention the Gator Lodge on Phillips Highway, you'll know what I'm talking about. The Gator Lodge is where prostitutes hang out. So that's where his friends put him up for the week. And so as we drove around the back, I'm like, you know, I can make you a better offer. I've got a room at home. And he said yes before I finished. So I had a roommate. And so I took him home. And then we all started going to church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Simeer, his name, he hated the wrestling T-shirts too. So one day I'm like, do you think I should take Marco to go get uh, Sunday clothes. He said, yes. He didn't, we didn't get into a discussion. He was just very straightforward, yes. So I took Marco, got him a white shirt, blue tie, blue pants, black belt, and black shoes and socks. Um, last Christmas, at the Christmas party, we were sitting at the table with Angela, and she mentioned a story about how a woman got saved and then the people in the church didn't appreciate her wardrobe. So she uh, was told that she needed to go change her clothes and get better clothes, more appropriate clothes. Um, that really rang home with me because you don't put that kind of pressure on somebody to make you happy. If you want to do something, then you show works of mercy. You go pay the money to go get that person clothes. So before, when we went to pick up Marco for church, he would fling open the door and run down the second floor, down to the car. The day I got on Sunday school clothes, he flung open the door, and then he walked down the aisle, and he checked himself out every step of the way. So, Let's read James 2, 17. And I'm going to put in some words to make it a little more clear. Even so faith, if it hath not works of mercy, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works of mercy. Show me thy faith without thy works of mercy, 
And I will show you the my show you my faith by my works of mercy. I like to read certain verses sometimes and just tweak it for the situation. Take Romans 33, 28, for instance. If you tweak it this way, you could say, therefore, Calvinists conclude that a man is justified by faith with the deeds of the law. Calvinists just totally get James chapter 2 wrong. So, one last thought. The Bible says with the, the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell a tree to pluck itself up and plant itself in the sea. You can tell the mountain to move and cast itself into the sea. The reality is you need less faith to be saved than you need faith to, to move a tree or to move a mountain. Thank you.